26 minutes past seven on a Tuesday morning. As world leaders search for a diplomatic solution to the crisis in Ukraine, Boris Johnson, as we've been telling you, is holding emergency Cobra talks in Downing Street this morning. Uh, but with fears that Putin could launch an invasion almost immediately, to what extent should Britain get involved? Joining us now is the security expert, Professor Anthony Gleese, and the deputy president of Stop the War Coalition, uh, Andrew Murray. Good morning to you both of morning. you. Good uh, morning. Professor, to you first. Um, we, of course, we know that uh, the British government has said that no British troops would enter Ukraine under any circumstances. But in terms of Britain's involvement, diplomatically and perhaps in being at, at the border with other Western countries around Ukraine, um, how important do you think it is that Britain is right there in the thick of it? It's absolutely vital. It's vital to the security of Europe, and I include the United Kingdom in that. Uh, in my opinion, and not just in my opinion, it would have been better if we'd actually sent far more troops to Ukraine, and it would be better if they were still there, because as long as our troops, NATO troops, are there, Putin will hesitate uh, about invading. But uh, we, are, we are where we are, and it's absolutely right that Britain should be the leading power, as I believe we are. Yes, <clears throat> we've taken a hit in our leadership over Brexit, and yes, we've taken a hit in our leadership over the shenanigans and Partygate, everybody knows that. But still, we are doughty, we are resolute, because we understand the bottom line is our own security here in the United Kingdom. Can I introduce the elephant in the room that very few people are talking about here? And that is that the main protagonists here, Britain, America, NATO and Russia, are nuclear armed. They have the bomb. Um, and how much of that, as a, as a background reality, how much of that is affecting what's happening? Because let's just assume, for example, that Russia didn't have the bomb. Would we be behaving in a rather different way militarily than we are now? Is it basically staying our hand? We have to keep this, the temperature down because these are nuclear states. Well, we do have to keep the temperature down. Only a complete idiot would want a war, and the people of Russia don't want a war, and the people of Ukraine don't want a war. But I think they will fight, and they'll fight very fiercely if their sovereignty is destroyed. But, yes, we are a nuclear power, along with France, United States of America, and... Uh, and, of course, Russia. And so we've got to be very careful indeed. That's why uh, even people who are hawkish, as I am, have always said, no, there's not going to be a nuclear war over Ukraine. Ukraine is not a member of NATO. It aspires to be one. And <clears throat> that's its sovereign expression of it, it, its will, that it aspires to be one. And NATO has an open-door policy, which is good. But it doesn't follow that Ukraine, for the foreseeable future, will be a member of NATO. No, this is about Putin threatening us. And he's threatening us in the West. He's seeking to undermine NATO. NATO's taken many knocks, not least from President Trump. People may remember he, he suggested America mm. pull out of NATO. Mm. But our fundamental security, uh, uh, that this is not a nuclear war, uh, will depend on the fact that we are a nuclear power and it is a, a key deterrent. Is there an unstoppable momentum to this? So, uh, returning to a point that we were discussing earlier in this programme, that when you have a huge military force, 150,000 troops on the border, not just milling about on exercise, but now in an, in an attack configuration, they're ready to go. That's what all the satellite intelligence is telling us. They are absolutely poised and in attack position. That after a while, it becomes inevitable. Well, that's certainly the, the experience of the past, is that once you get very large numbers of troops ready for battle and they've been, you know, doing so-called manoeuvres uh, on three sides of Ukraine for a very long time now, uh, sooner or later you get propelled into war. A, a, a former British MI6 chief was saying just the other day that he felt that Putin had gone too far to, to, to climb down again. And... A minor accident could trigger this, or it, it could be intention. But certainly, despite what Russia is saying right now, that uh, the, the exercises are almost over and people are packing their bags and getting ready to go home, the truth is that we know there's a build-up of ships in the Black Sea. Uh, we know that medical supplies are being uh, 
taken up to the, 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 the front. We know where the troops are massing uh, to a, launch an attack, possibly, on Kiev. And a, a key point here, if I may just add this, this intelligence that is being passed, this secret intelligence from Washington and from London, is not to convince the British public that this is a war that should be justified, not to convince MPs in Parliament to support this war. It is to demonstrate to President Putin, first of all, that we know a lot more about his plans because we can see what he's doing. And secondly, of course, okay. his track record of trying to recreate the, the okay. territory of the former Soviet Union. That is his Professor. aim and his intention. Yes. Um, let's talk okay. to Andrew Murray, who is the Deputy President of the Stop the War Coalition. You feel very differently, don't you, about um, Britain's uh, leader, Britain leading the way and being involved in a, in a potential war in Ukraine. What's your view in the sense that, of course, we are affected economically here with what happens there? We can't really back away from it, can we? Well, I think the only resolution to this crisis, uh, at least between Ukraine and Russia, is for Ukraine and Russia to sort it out for themselves. They have a Minsk agreement that both the governments of Ukraine and Russia signed seven years ago, which has never really been implemented. But that is a, a proper basis for resolving that side of the crisis. The other side of the crisis, which obviously President Putin has been trying to highlight, is Russia's uh, uh, own security issues with the expansion of NATO, which they were promised in 1990. The Americans promised Gorbachev there would be no expansion of NATO. It wouldn't move an inch eastwards. It has moved eastwards a long way since. Uh, and this is felt to be very threatening. And that is the issue that the British government needs to be addressing. What has been extraordinary is how negative uh, and even provocative the British government has been throughout this crisis, unlike, say, the French or the German governments that have been trying to find a basis for a diplomatic solution. The British government has simply been sabre-rattling. It has been talking up war at every turn. It's been saying there's going to be an invasion tomorrow, there's going to be one this week, there's going to be a coup, there's going to be a false so flag incident. That did come from American but, uh, intelligence. To be fair to well, the British it, government, they were reacting well, to intelligence uh, well, that was coming from their allies. Do you? Well, there there is the... a sense from me that do you think that there is another reason why you think that in this country that uh, war, war is being talked of, that perhaps the problems here domestically for Boris Johnson might be, might be partly why. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to exaggerate that particular point. I mean, probably a distraction does help Boris Johnson at the moment uh, with all the party gate. Uh, but I think it's about uh, the British and the American governments uh, wanting to extend their own power and influence right up to the borders of Russia. Now, you, you say, talk about intelligence. Those of us that remember the Iraq war, and I'm sure we all do, can tell what utter disasters intelligence, so-called intelligence, can lead us into. Uh, that was a war fought on the basis of false intelligence. And let me just say two quick things about NATO. Okay. Firstly, no state has a right to join NATO. Joining NATO is at the discretion of its existing members, which basically ultimately means the government of the United States. They decide who comes into NATO uh, and who doesn't. And the second thing is, it, it cannot now be seen just as a defensive alliance as it was presented during the Cold War. We've had the wars in Yugoslavia in 1999, in Afghanistan, and we saw how disastrously that went in Libya, all of which were fought under uh, NATO auspices. The Iraq war wasn't a NATO war, but the main NATO powers played a leading part in it. Okay. It is not surprising that the Russian government would see the expansion of a NATO that has behaved like this over the last generation uh, as threatening. And I think we can take, take some encouragement from the fact that yesterday all sides seem to be saying there's more time for diplomacy, there's more time to get a peaceful solution. And the Ukrainian president was even indicating, not definitively, but indicating that Ukraine could park its aspirations to join NATO. That would be a basis yes. for a well, settlement. Let's hope so. <laughs> OK, well, absolutely. OK, I'm, I'm going to have to stop you there, but you've made the points with great clarity. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, but we're out of time. Uh, could talk about this all morning.